Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast, where we highlight everyday humans doing crazy, amazing things. People just like you and me who utilize their time, talents, and resources to give back, pay it forward, and make a difference. I'm Katrina Carlson. And I'm Jefferson Denham. We want to thank you so much for joining us from wherever you are on this crazy, amazing planet. We believe it's more important than ever to stay connected, stay positive, and stay active. And if you agree, oh, you are in the right place. I agree, Jefferson. <laughs> and I don't know if you know this, but we are celebrating our two-year anniversary of our podcast, everyone. Yay! Two years! <laughs> and we have a very special guest today, Cheryl Wu Dunn, the mm. first Asian-American reporter to win a Pulitzer Prize. She's a best-selling author and a successful business executive who makes positive social impact in all that she does. Also a wife and mother of three, Cheryl has a passion to help others that is simply astounding. Astounding, absolutely. Astounding. So through her gifts in journalism and media, Cheryl has mobilized and galvanized efforts to bring awareness to the marginalized and those in need, not only in the United States, but really all over the world. And Katrina and I think she is the epitome of a crazy, amazing human. Yes, she I'm is. definitely excited for this. <laughs> I don't know if you can tell, you know, we're always looking to bring you the most uplifting and inspiring stories. Oh, and this is one of them. So let's dive in, shall let's we? Let's dive in. And we just want to remind you, we really appreciate you and reminding you that you, you are, are crazy, crazy amazing. amazing. I want you to This is Malika Chopra, and you're listening to the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast with Katrina Carlson and Jefferson Denham. Hey, Crazy Amazing Humans. We are here with our guest, Cheryl Wu Dunn, who is the first Asian American reporter to win a Pulitzer Prize. She is a co-founder of Full Sky Partners, a consulting firm focusing on double bottom line ventures, mostly in healthcare and technology. The double bottom line means that they seek to extend the conventional bottom line, which measures fiscal performance, such as financial profit or loss, by adding a second bottom line to measure performance in terms of positive social impact. She also helps run Christoph Farms, a young vineyard and cider apple orchard in Oregon. Cheryl is also co-author of five books, along with fellow crazy, amazing human guest, Nicholas Christoph from episode 16. In yeah, right. <laughs> Including the books, Half the Sky, Turning Oppression into Opportunity for Women Worldwide, A Path Appears, Transforming Lives and Creating Opportunity, and their latest tightrope, Americans Reaching for Hope which is about the challenges of the working class today. Previously, Cheryl was a vice president in the investment management division at Goldman Sachs. That's right. And Cheryl is also one of a small handful of people who have worked at the New York Times, both as an executive and as a journalist. She was elected this year to the Harvard University Board of Overseers. She's also a former member of the Board of Trustees at Princeton and Cornell. I mean, can you do more, Cheryl? What's going on? I know, right? <laughs> You're amazing. And so Cheryl Rudon also has a BA from Cornell, an MPA from Princeton, and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Cheryl Rudon, welcome <laughs> to the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast. Woo! Thank you, Christina. Thank you. It's great to be here. We always like to start off with a little background on our guests. Uh, it's just kind of fun to see, you know, how did you get here? So if you could tell us, you know, about growing up and what might have been the spark leading to you to where you are now. I mean, was it always a straight line where there's zigs and say, tell us about you. Well, I think probably it's just easier to say that I jumped on certain opportunities, I suppose. It's always hard to know when an opportunity arises that you should jump on. So I guess I got lucky in those circumstances. The biggest break I had, of course, was when I was in China and Nick and I were writing for the New York Times. And we saw this, obviously this democracy protest just kind of bubbling up. And I remember thinking, cause I was out on 
you know, Peking University, Beida, Beijing University, and watching this one young, very, very sort of kind of immature college student named Wang Dan, who was sitting there trying to hold a democracy salon. And it seemed like, oh my goodness, this is kind of funny. I mean, there were like 10 people there. There was a professor, an astrophysicist, Professor Fang Lijiu. And we thought, oh my gosh, this is the democracy movement, right? Of course, we, as reporters, it was something new. So we went there, we wrote down everything that they said. And, you know, we thought, oh, well, you know, that's okay. We'll find other things to write about. <laughs> and so then it started growing. That little democracy salon started growing from 10 people to 25 people to 100 people. We were like, oh, okay, 100 people, that's nice. And then they said, we're having a protest on, on April 27th. It was 1989. Oh yeah, they'll have a protest. And, and then we're going to walk from the university district to Tiananmen Square. Oh, okay. That, that sounds fine. We thought we'd drive. We drove all the way out there. We you know, followed in the car. Thousands of students showed up. I have no idea how it went from just a few people to thousands and thousands and thousands of students marched from the university district to Tiananmen Square, partly to honor the death of Hu Yaobang, but of course it also was to show that they really <laughs> care about the future of, of their country. And that's how it started. And I remember just thinking, gosh, just from this one little seed, and it could have just been crushed, but it just blossomed. It was um, really a day of making history because I think that was the beginning of the really large democracy movement there. And I remember one of my Chinese friends saying, let's go, we've got to march with them. And I said, well, I can't march, I'm a reporter, um, but let's at least walk and talk to people because this is history in the making. And she was so absolutely right. You know, sometimes you just forget, you're so busy like taking down notes and you know, interviewing people that you forget to just like smell the roses and say, wait a second, this really is a big history day. Wow. And then you all, that's the reporting that you won the Pulitzer Prize for. Well, then it became a series mm. of yeah. uh, stories and the unfolding of a democracy movement that then got absolutely crushed. So it was, the reason I think it was such a powerful moment in history was that here you had this surge of excitement and you, you the, the students and the people there felt, this was 10 million people in China were involved in some of these protests, you know, on the verge of something really different and then absolutely crush, crushing. And they killed hundreds of people. We, to this day, don't know the exact number of people who were you know, shot down by the military. Nick was actually on this part of the square where they were shooting. And remember, he's much taller than the average Chinese. Oh so goodness. his head stood up, stood out. Bigger target. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And so thankfully nothing happened. Thankfully. That was really, really well, pretty. And serious. you know, Cheryl, uh, Katrina and I were marveling at the fact that you got married in 1988. And 19... <laughs> 89, just what you're newlyweds. Yes, really. right. You're newlyweds oh, doing that. Boy. Also, also for our listeners, I mean, remember, there was no social media back then. I mean, there was no way to communicate with people. I mean, I guess you could pick up the phone and I'm sure people had flyers, but how they got, I can, you're as being astonished at that is so well warranted in that day and age, especially, you know. Well, so the interesting thing was that was the first time where a basically democracy movement was televised. It was one of the first moments of television because the television cameras, the networks happened to be there for a summit. And so they had given, they've granted a lot of these journalists, journalist visas because they wanted, you know, the outside world to cover. I think it was like the, the Russia China summit or something like that. So there was a big meeting at the time. And mm -hmm. so it happened all, of course, no one was covering the summit. <laughs> <laughs> Every, yes. I mean, where, that was all dramatic. the cameras were there for that. And mm -hmm. it was, it was, uh, uh, there was a lot of luck involved that people didn't get hurt. Uh, you know, that even more thousands of people could have been shot dead. I mean, there was a lot of miraculous, you know, uh, wow. things happening at that time. And so I would say just being able to do the right thing um, at the right time 
was what I got lucky with. I mean, it really, you ha when you have an opportunity like that, you just make sure you have to do the right thing at the right time. <laughs> well, we sure are lucky that you both were there at the right time, doing the right thing. And so I have been to Tiananmen Square. I was there in 1990, actually. And the guide would not tell us anything about what happened in Tiananmen Square and and whatnot. So I it really, that whole event really was a huge impact on me. I had just graduated from college and I remember it very vividly and was in Tiananmen Square months later. There were still pavers that were broken in Tiananmen Square and they, you know, we were asking our guide and he wasn't even allowed to talk about it. So yeah, they really squashed that movement for sure. Yeah, yeah. And so we love that you cover things like that. And we are also in a time right now where we're highlighting International Women's Day. And that's another subject that's very close to your heart, I believe because you wrote such an amazing book on that. So you are the perfect guest to do this, not least of which, which is Half This Guy, Turning Oppression into Opportunity for Women Worldwide that you wrote with Nicholas. And another thing is you've been quoted saying that one of the best ways to fight poverty is to educate women and give them economic opportunity. So can you tell us how and why you came to that conclusion as per this book? First of all, when we came up with the idea of this, we weren't sure that it was actually a book. It started out partly because when we were in China, again, you know, we started seeing a phenomenon. This is, you know, post Tiananmen Square. We started seeing a phenomenon called in Chinese, Guai Mai Fu Nu. It meant the abduction and sale of women. So this actually was a a, a phrase <laughs> that wow. was just, you know, a, an established phrase in Chinese that had been, you know, used for many, many years. So clearly it was something that had been established. What happens is that people abduct women from villages in one area. These are remote sort of villages where people are not educated and they transport them thousands of miles to another remote village in China where they don't speak the local language. And in China, if you don't speak the local language, they're, the dialects are so different sometimes that it's almost like speaking a foreign language. So you really cannot communicate. And a lot of these people can't write. So it's not as though they can write characters and you know communicate that way. So these women basically are abducted and they're sold as brides to other uh, peasant men who can't afford. I mean, you know, no one wants to marry a, a poor peasant. So they have to buy a wife. And so that phenomenon, it was really puzzling that there was a phrase, you know, in my mind, I thought, wow, I've got to look more into this. And there actually is an active market, you know, where people get kidnapped, women get kidnapped. And it, it also it happens elsewhere too, like in the urban markets among people who are very poor and they're abducted and they're sold to an area where they don't know, you know, anything. You don't know where you are often because there's no signage of how to get anywhere. You can't get to another city. So you really are kind of lost in an alien world. And so we saw that there was this market and I thought, well, this is just China. I mean, this stuff, you know, China is full of good and full of, you know, some evil. And this is just that dark side, but it's just China. And so we wrote about some of this in China Wakes, a book that we wrote after we left China. And then we moved to, to Japan and it covered Asia. And uh, we went to Southeast Asia. Nick actually discovered another uh, horrible phenomenon. There was the sex trade in Cambodia, where again, they were actually kidnapping women, selling them in brothels, where they would have to be forced labor. And of course, they don't get paid a dime, and yet they're being forced to work uh, with not no pay and also very little food. And so it was a terrible phenomenon, but we thought, okay, and, and there were other parts in, in, in other areas of Asia where there's more discrimination. We just thought, well, you know, certainly India has problems too, but that's just Asia, right? So we thought this is unfortunate, but this is Asia. And then we came back to the US and Nick started traveling as a columnist to Africa. And he started seeing some of these horrible treatments of women as well there, rape, you know, you know, kidnapping and, and, and cruelty. And so we started thinking, wow, this is more of a phenomenon than we'd ever thought. It's kind of a global phenomenon. So we ended up doing a lot more research on that. And the result was half the sky, which shows that it really was a global phenomenon. So that was the phenomenon. And then we started looking at what are the solutions? What can we do? And much to our pleasant surprise, 
it turns out there are a lot of local organizations that already stumbled upon this problem. I mean, it, it was obviously, if you're local, you see that this is a problem that's been around for a long time and looking for solutions. And a lot of them came up with great solutions, uh, educating women so that women can fight back or that they know, you know, what to do if, you know, they're confronted or they can at least, you know, spare the rest of their family members. And so, you know, if a woman starts getting more educated, she can do a lot more to defend herself. But the other thing is that in a lot of communities, we discovered that when a woman actually is given an opportunity to make money or to sell her vegetables that she grows in the field, then she can do really, really well. In, in Burundi, for instance, women are not allowed to touch money. And so we, there was a woman that we write about in Half the Sky where every time she, you know, they would go to the market, uh, she would go with her husband, they'd go to the market, she'd point to what she wanted to buy, he would pay for it with the money, and then they would, you know, get the stuff in their basket and go back home. And the other thing is that if she wanted to leave the home, she had to get permission from her husband. So this is the kind of constraints that, you know, women uh, in that village and in that area live under. And so finally, her mother-in-law encouraged her to go to this little savings group of women that had been formed in the village. And what happens is that, like, you know, 10 women get together, they each bring like the equivalent of a dime, and they put it into the center, and they pool their money and say, okay, this month, this money goes to you, you're going to use it. And then you're going to pay us back with whatever you make from that. And so she took that money and she decided to invest in a crop of potatoes. And so that is a cash crop that normally only men plant, but she decided to do it. So she invested in a crop of potatoes. She had a harvest, a, you know, a bounty crop. And so she not only could pay back, you know, the loan, but she also had extra money that she reinvested in another potato crop. And then she started growing other things. Pretty soon, she was like the local tycoon because she was so <laughs> successful. And it was an example of when you give a woman a chance um, at economic opportunity, then they, you know, can do so well. And then she gave back. So she would, you know, she became sort of like the mentor of other women in the village. She obviously brought her kids along. Her husband actually decided, you know, maybe wow. I should jump onto her side. Too. Maybe she knows <laughs> something. Benefit, yeah. from, benefit from this. So it was an example of just how economic opportunity really can lift a woman really when she gets that she lifts up everyone around her it's not just me 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 Katrina and I love that you um in all your books that we mentioned earlier you're all you focus on the dark side uh Katrina and I talk about this and then you come up with a solution so you just don't just leave us scrambling right. and right? I was just going to interject that you know I read somewhere related to your writings uh that a woman will spend 90 percent of her income on her family while men typically spend only 35 percent I think that's your quote or something so why can you speak to that a little bit just in relation to this because when you empower women you it empowers everyone around them in many ways especially the family and yeah absolutely yeah. and part of that is because and this is just more empirical. It's not like, you know, I have an ideology about it, but, you know, we saw this from the research that people had done and what they found, which is that when men who had the cash crops in the very beginning, they would take their money and then they'd go buy cigarettes. They'd go, you know, meet people at the local pub and they'd spend their money on the, on, you know, on alcohol. So a lot of it just gets whittled away. You know, it's my money. I earned it. <laughs> it gets whittled away. Whereas a woman, when she gets, she saves it. She wants to save it for her kid's health, for her kid's education. And she doesn't spend it on herself. So, I mean, you know, obviously you want her to spend some of it on herself, but she saves it for her kids. Mm -hmm. mm. The stories we see in that uh, documentary, uh, Crazy Amazing Humans, make sure if you haven't seen it yet, you should. Yeah. Um, Some I, other things you mentioned it, I just want to say is like education, microfinance strategies, and effective exercise of political will. I love that you guys brought those up as being, you know, really giving people ways for solutions. Can you speak a little bit to that? Any examples? I mean, we just kind of spoke a little bit about microfinancing the way those women created that circle. Right. So them. micro savings is really has shown to be very empirically very successful. Microfinance is a little bit different, but they found that micro savings, the way it's actually brought about and done and conducted by a lot of these, um, yeah, there are a lot of external nonprofit organizations that have helped seed these micro savings groups. 
that's been really, really powerful, more so than microfinance. There have been very successful microfinance, uh, micro lending uh, operations as well, but they have found that micro savings leads even more, you know, of a bounty. But, you know, I have to say that, look, this is not easy for every, you know, success story. There are also failures. So mm-hmm. for instance, one operation, one research uh, was looking into you know, you wonder, you hear all these stories about micro lending, micro savings, and, you know, everybody's an entrepreneur, they can be so, be so successful, but they actually looked at the spectrum of people when they got loans and what they did with them and how successful they were. And they discovered that one third were terrible at it. They just lost the money. They were just not good. Mm-hmm. And then one third were, you know, all right, they broke even, they did okay, maybe. And then it was like the other third that did really, really well. Okay. So there's a spectrum. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah, it's well, not all with any, Right, right. With any <laughs> effort, it must be that way. Now, in your, we noticed in a TED Talk you did, which was entitled Our Century's Greatest Injustice, mm. very provocative title. I think it's all about, along the same lines as we're discussing. But you did something that Katrina and I were really taken aback with. I thought this was powerful. You asked the audience if there are more men or more women in the world. Can you elaborate on that? Well, so, well, first I'll ask you, and you may know the answer already, but- I saw the video. (laughs) We know the answer. (laughs) But is it still true? Uh, You Go ahead, test us, test the audience. Okay, all right. So are there more men or more women in the world? How many of you think, well, which one of you thinks there's more men in the world? Raise your hand. Well, I'm just gonna say that I, more women in the world? You're not I supposed thought, to talk. I You're supposed thought, to raise your hand. Oh, okay. Well, People I will are say watching this and doing I, this, Kat. I did think there were more <laughs> women in the world. I right. do think. That's what, that's I, what think. I thought, too. And that's what most of us in the developing world, in the developed world, think because when men and women have equal access to healthcare, to food, there isn't a problem. But in much of the world, when you start going beyond the developed world, you find that there is not equal access to healthcare uh, and to food and nutrition. And as a result, there are more men in the world because there's basically discrimination to death you know, in, you know, against women in many parts of the world. Mm-hmm. Now, it was improving partly because poverty itself was being reduced before the pandemic. Now, the pandemic has really thrown an ugly wrench into all of this progress, and poverty is back, I mean, just because of we all know what the pandemic did, Mm -hmm. Uh, and a lot of these poorer areas in the poorer countries are suffering hugely. You know, thankfully, their levels of COVID haven't created the number of the types of, of mortality rates that we're seeing here in the U.S., but it does mean that there's been sort of, I think, negative progress, perhaps, you know, with lifting women up with, you know, reducing poverty rates. I'm hoping that that will reverse. And I know that there's an effort to try and reverse that. Absolutely. So in marking, you know, this International Women's Day, is there anything that, you know, you would say or, you know, want people to know about women? So currently in in 2022, you know, like the status of women in 2022. Well, I would like to actually talk about the status of women in the U.S. as well, and not at the level that we normally think about. We normally think about, okay, 85% of a, you know, a man's dollar, you know, women only earns that much, but just at a more basic level. Women have higher rates of education at the college level, but, you know, when you talk about, you know, grade school level, women, girls can do better, but I think that we need to lift up, you know, our there is poverty in the U.S., you know, enormous amount of poverty, and there's been more poverty because of the pandemic. We basically hurt our gains, and so we need to be really uh, attentive to the impact that this has had on women and on uh, girls. They had to be caregivers, right? And so they stepped out of their jobs if they had them. Now it's really hard to juggle a lot of things because while schools are open again, you know, there are, they shut down if there's an Omicron case. And I mean, it's just crazy. And childcare is something that is so important. Childcare has two goals in some ways. And I think that I really hope that it does get passed in, uh, you know, the national, uh, the, the national bill. On the one hand, it does provide child care for, you know, uh, working class mothers who are the ones who end up bearing the brunt of, of you know, child care if they, if they uh, don't have it and they can't afford it. It's very expensive. The second thing is that 
often childcare is actually educational. So for instance, you put a kid in preschool, that is so important. It's just, you can't imagine how important it is mm. for a kid to have, to be exposed to educational opportunities, you know, three, four, five years old. That is when the brain is growing the fastest it ever will. So the brain of a, you know, from zero to five, that little kid's brain is growing faster than ours. I mean, it's right. just early like, education, and, key, exactly. right? So when it's so malleable, that's mm-hmm. when they need to absorb as much as possible. And so many of our kids who are in poverty are not absorbing that. So that means yeah. that by the time they start education, they are way behind the starting line, you know, the normal mm-hmm. starting line. So we need to bring those kids up to the starting line so that they have an opportunity uh, at the kind of, you know, uh, at, at a chance in economic livelihood and, and a re- higher standard of living, uh, you know, than they currently have. And so mm. I think that's so important. And we underestimate the importance of that nowadays in, in, in the U.S. Can I just ask a follow up quick question on that? And I'm just going to throw myself under the bus with this. I'm a guy. And the reason I bring this up is I was a creative arts director at a church and my mentor was a woman, brilliant. And I was at a conference with her and she stood up in front of everyone and said, if you're a man, you need to make room at the table. You've got the cards. And if you don't recognize the potential that's being lost, men need to make an adjustment. Men need to change. And I really took that to heart. And Katrina and I were both raised by single moms. We get it. We love the heroes. So what would you tell guys? What is our role in this in empowering women? I know this is a big question probably, but <laughs> well, what would you tell men? Well, first of all, I would say this is not a zero sum game. It's not as though if you make room at the table that, you know, you're going to get squished, right? You can have, you can create a bigger table. I mean, that's what's so important is that we have to create a bigger pie for everybody. And that's what it means when you actually try and lift up women, because they're going to lift up everyone around them too. They're not, you know, yeah. look, I can't generalize and say every woman is going to be like that. Mm-hmm. But I think in general, mm-hmm. uh, women do tend to bring along their, their family and their friends with them. And men can too, they really do. But I think that it's just more of an enlightened perspective that we should try and lift as many people up as possible, rather than say, well, it's, me versus you, it's a zero sum game. So if mm-hmm. I, you know, uh, get ahead and I don't give anything to you, I'll have more. Well, no, you can actually be inventive. You can be creative and actually expand the pie. And we had that in the 1970s. In the 1970s, our economy was basically expanding the pie so that even the people at the lower income level, their incomes were rising as well as people at the top. But now it's become much more difficult so that you know, you've got the upper income, the higher income people, they're really lifting themselves up. And the people at the lower end are lifting up a little bit, but the mobility, it's become such a less mobile society. We think of England, right? The, uh-huh. the England as a very classist society, you know, just all the history associated with, with the kings and queens. And, you know, this is a very classist society, but actually, and research is very hard uh, to come by on this because it's hard to actually pin down. But uh, it's pretty. It seems pretty clear that mobility in the UK is faster and higher, and you know there's more mobility in the UK than there is in the US. I am shocked by that. That's crazy. So people are really staying where they are, and they're just not not being able to increase their income. I mean, now we just have such a huge gap. I mean, and just the the range of wealth in the US from. The rate, how much wealth there is, and then how much poverty there is. It's just getting larger and larger, and it does seem kind of insurmountable for. I wonder in some it, ways. It, and to Katrina's point, uh, we know that Half the Sky, powerhouse book, off, awesome documentary film, still resonating today. And then, and I'm wondering if this is what led you to do it. Then you co-founded an organization called Full Sky Partners. Can you tell us about Full Sky? Right. So Full Sky, actually, the name was actually thought of of by my colleague who said, well, let's actually take the concept of Half the Sky and, you know, because he's a man, (laughs) let's make it Full Sky. And the whole idea behind that is to really find companies who can embrace uh, social value. In other words, more head on. I mean, there, you know, every company that is successful is going to offer some value. 
but let's really say that this is a value that helps society. So a lot of our, you know, projects are in healthcare because healthcare is an area that you can really, you know, sort of have a metric for how it helps people. So for instance, one company that we're working with and helping now is a pain management company without pills. It's creating a platform that tries to manage pain without pills, you know, you know, opioids and all that sort of stuff. Right. So it, it's trying to work with people who are trying to actually reduce their pill consumption. consumption. Yeah. yeah. Consumption. Yeah. It's, you know, also trying to figure out ways to get people to prevent themselves from developing an opioid addiction. Uh, it's also working with people to change their behaviors so that they actually can wean themselves off of medication. That's some heavy, heavy uh, subject matter and what you're doing. It takes more time. You know, people just want to give someone a pill and say, oh, that you'll <laughs> take a pill and move on, you know, but I'm sure what you're doing is a lot more intricate process of helping people. And that is what we need to do with so many things now, because we can't just take a pill and, and move on. Right. So, so good on you. That sounds like an amazing adventure. So let's just turn to another subject that is based on something that I think is near and dear to your heart. It's definitely near to ours as well. And you've spoken about it many times. And I will say it's altruism, giving, and why doing good does you good. You've spoken about the neurological science behind how giving lights up the part of the brain that is the same area that is stimulated when you're experiencing pleasure or engaging in pleasurable activity. Activity. Like eating like, cherry pie? Like it, yes, or, or <laughs> apple pie. Or, or apple yes. pie or yeah. candy. And, you know, I love the term helper's high, this idea. So I thought, could you just unpack that overall concept for us? Well, the idea when we were writing A Path of Peers, we were actually looking at a lot of the uh, what goes on in the brain. And I had mentioned earlier about what happens when a, you know, kid who's from zero to five under, you know, uh, what happens in their brain, what's going on when they're actually learning and, and how important it is to give them st stimulation when they're that young because their brain is so malleable. We also looked at other parts of the brain that ha and what happens when you actually give. So there's some interesting experiments that actually show, you know, when people are sort of hooked up to a fMRI uh, and they are told, okay, you know, give $10 and they measure what happens in the brain. And then uh, what happens when you receive $10 uh, and then they measure what happens when you find that out and what happens in your brain. And interestingly enough, they discovered that some people, well, so it's nice to receive $10, right? Um, maybe they make it $100, whatever. Uh, but for some people, actually, when they give the $10 or $100, they actually uh, feel more uh, pleasure than when they actually receive the $10 or $100. So it was very interesting. Not all, I mean, but, you know, but by and large, it's very, you know, parity. And so it's counterintuitive. You wouldn't think, wow, if I'm giving $10, why would I be happy, right? right. <laughs> well, it's because it's the act of giving. Uh, people really do have a sort of genetic predisposition uh, to actually liking to give. And it's true that people are born with different predispositions. And it is interesting that there are genetic markers. So some people just are, you know, you've got on one extreme, Mother Teresa. She just was born like that, right? On the other hand, you've got like Machiavelli. He was born like that, right? right. Most of us are in between. <laughs> and <laughs> So we also can move back and forth and float. You can sort of train yourself or you can do it more often and you'll, you'll find more pleasure in it. But generally people do find pleasure when they are giving to a cause that means something to them. So often when they're giving to a cause larger than themselves, uh, they feel good about it. They feel, you know, I think that's also when people go to church, they feel very engaged and they feel like they're giving and they feel more prone to, they're more involved in, in giving. I've also heard that, you know, it can boost your immune system because of course these good feelings and good, you know, th what chemicals that are being released, giving you pleasure, giving you that sense it gives you a sense of well-being that can then make you feel, you know, it can actually boost your immune system a bit when you're experiencing that more than let's say you're feeling terrible, right? It kind of makes sense. Yeah. So uh, certainly oxytocin when you're feeling good is what just rushes through your, your brain and that gives you the helper's high. And I can understand, I've not really researched this, but I can understand that when you are under stress, 
you are more vulnerable, you know, to disease. I mean, you're just, you know, your entire body is stressed. And so it's the defenses are down. And so you aren't as able to fight, you know, you know, whatever antagonists come into your body. So I can understand how the converse could be true. So Cheryl and Katrina, if you guys, I'll, I'm doing it for you. If you want to give me $10 each <laughs> so you can feel better, I'll help you. I'm a giver. I'm, a, I'm that kind of guy. So, you know, I got to say, Katrina and I love emphasizing this because uh, Katrina has made sure that on every one of our newsletters, we make mention of the fact that neuroscience proves that even listening to stories like this, inspiring stories, can get your brain working in a better way and make you feel better. I mean, we're now also, you elaborated in another talk you gave, Cheryl, where you said um, that if you're feeling down, if you're feeling depressed, I just got to say, this is where I live. This is my kind of reality. And I've seen it to be true, what you said to do, which is do something for someone else and it'll make you feel better. It doesn't have to be grandiose, but every little gesture of kindness can make a big difference in you your life and the lives of others, right? Isn't that what the science says? I think that is so true. You know, there, I don't know how much work has been done about grieving. Obviously that's a different, maybe a different situation, but certainly that, you know, if you're feeling depressed and you get yourself out, you go to maybe, you know, you go to, you know, a, a homeless shelter to help out there, or you go to, you know, a, a food uh, service company that's donating food, a soup kitchen. I, I do think that you can feel better. And, you know, I don't, I, I'm sure there's been some research on that. So I haven't actually looked into the, you know, deep research on this, but I do think that there, it makes total sense that this would help you. And I've seen, a lot of what it could do to help people who are in sort of impoverished situations as well. That sometimes, you know, there's a downward spiral where, you know, they are feeling terrible, they make terrible decisions, and then they, you know, they just, you know, it's a downward spiral. But if you can pull them out and get them engaged in a cause that you can begin to pull them out of that downward spiral. That is awesome. I love that. And, you know, there are a lot of problems facing a lot of people in this world. And there are a lot of organizations that need charitable donations. And, you know, it can feel very overwhelming for all of us, you know, to go through this and talk about these things. And um, I wanted to go back to your book, um, A Path Appears, where you and Nicholas help us weed through those issues, give practical and results driven advice so that we can find a path to make a difference. And I just thought, could you highlight some of those main components that help us in accomplishing that? What we do is we actually have a page that, that you know, gets you started with kind of the 10 things that you could do in 10 minutes. And some of it is, first of all, finding a, a cause that you care about. So whether it's education, whether it's domestic or international, I mean, if there, there may be a girl's school that you might want to, you know, help out a little bit by sending money for lunches. Lunches help girls stay in school because the meal brings them into school and the, the parents want them to get fed in school rather than them having to feed their kid in a lot of these places. So, you know, there's ways to actually give tiny bits of uh, tiny amounts of money or you can help, you know, locally, you know, in your own community, uh, going with a friend to, you know, go to a soup kitchen on a holiday or something like that. I mean, I, Thanksgiving is a perfect time to do this or President's, uh, you know, day as well, or Martin Luther King we just had, and, you know, people did it then as well. So I think that it's a lot of fun when you do it with some friends, um, you know, you know, you certainly can do it by yourself, but I, I, I'm just trying to say that basically when you do it with friends, it's a lot more fun and you'll you know, appreciate it more and you'll want to do it again. Yeah, it kind of helps you stick to it when you do it with someone else. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, to, to just to tag on what Katrina, I love that question, Katrina, because I think it does feel overwhelming sometimes. And you said, you shared in a talk, the story of the starfish. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Could you yes, share yes. that story right now? And then how maybe that has impacted your life personally, as far as how you look at how to give? Well, so there is this father and son who are walking down the beach, and it's just littered with starfish. And the little boy starts picking up a starfish and throwing it back in the water, picks up another starfish and throws it back in the water. And the dad says, son, um, you know, why are you doing that? There's thousands of starfish, you know, on the beach. There's no way you can get to all of them. 
and the son picks up another starfish, throws it into the water, and said, it made a big difference for that one. So, <laughs> boom. I love that. I love it. It's great. You know, yeah. every little bit counts. That's what it's yeah. saying. Yeah. You know, and you never know what kind of impact you can have on someone. So, okay, in a commencement speech you gave at Rice University in 2016, you spoke about making empathy a priority. What was the primary message you wanted to convey in relation to that? I think that basically when kids go off to college, I mean, they've got giant dreams, which is great. And they have lots of ideas and plans for the future. And I just want to remind them that the one thing that they should remember, because it will help them in their own lives, is to have empathy. And that does get back to the points that both you, Katrina and JD, were raising about, you know, when you're giving, you know, you also feel, you know, better and you, you feel, you know, better about yourself as well. And that's a little bit of, of what empathy also gives you. It's just when you understand more about, you know, what's going on in someone else's world, you know, one, if they're in a situation where they're very vulnerable, they're homeless or something like that, they're a person too. They're not just this homeless, you know, uh, vagabond that, you know, that you can't, that, that's an other, right? You're not, right. you can otherize them, yes. but realize that there's a person behind that. We will always at some point in our life be down. And we, when we are down, we don't want to be otherized by other mm -hmm. people too. So it's a reminder that, you know, we're all vulnerable at some point in our life. And so just remember that for your future. Thank, Thank you, you for, for that. And so I want to take a, a little turn now to talk about your neighborhood there in Oregon where you're living. Now I have an affinity from, for Oregon because my entire family is from Oregon, both my, my mom's side of the family, my father's side of the family, and they met in Oregon. And every summer I would go there, we would stay in Portland and in Gearhart out by the beach. Um, it's just so much fun, such a beautiful state. So my family has roots there, your family has deep roots there. And I think it's a factor in what drew you and Nick to writing and creating the project Tightrope, Americans Reaching for Hope, which is right behind you on your screen. <laughs> if you're watching, listeners, you, you would see that she's got this beautiful backdrop of the, the, the town you live in. So you wrote Tightrope. It addresses the crisis in working class America while focusing on solutions. So can you tell us a little bit about your experiences with that project? Yes. Well, this, uh, I have to say, was the most personal um, book that we wrote, partly because Nick grew up with a lot of the people that we write about, and I've met them, known them for decades as well since we've been married. And so it was a little bit harder to write because it was so personal that we were, unfortunately, we were meeting his friends who were struggling with some of the you know, things that lead to deaths of despair. So deaths of despair is a, is a phrase that was uh, coined by a couple of economists at Princeton, where they actually analyzed census data and they discovered that most in most demographics, people's uh, lifespans are increasing. We're living longer, you know, because we've got great health and, you know, we're living longer. However, except there's one category where people are actually dying off sooner, and that's in working class whites working class whites, and a lot of it in rural areas. And so where we live right now outside of Portland, about an hour outside of Portland, is one of those rural white neighborhoods. And it's striking what's happened to Nick's friends he went to high school with. There are deaths of despair. People, deaths of despair, there's three types. One is death from alcohol-related diseases. One is addiction-related uh, deaths. And the other is suicide. And so those three categories have actually also intensified during the pandemic uh, as a result of the pandemic, but they were already rising, you know, in, you know, before the pandemic. And in fact, they contributed to the pre-pandemic uh, trend, which was that overall, because there were so many of them, uh, you know, dying, uh, the overall trend of average lifespan in the U.S. was, was dipping except for one year, but it was dipping. And so obviously now with COVID, we've had, you know, terrible statistics on that front, but it's, you know, it is a real crisis that we saw around us and wrote about just the struggles that they face. And there was a documentary that was done about them as well. And, uh, you know, one of them is a 
old friend of, of Nick's. He kn knew the family, the kids all very well. They used to ride in his school bus uh, with him, the number six school bus. All the kids, when they were young, they would all jump into the bus and they'd be having fun and, you know, telling jokes. And it was just so hard to realize that, you know, decades later, what happened to those little kids? Well, a lot of them are either no longer with us or they're struggling with not good jobs. They dropped out of high school early on, so they didn't have a high school degree, at, you know, even. And in those days, maybe it was okay. You could get by without a high school degree. But now, as you know, it's impossible to get a job if you don't have even a high school degree. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's why education we see is so important. And is some of this about the jobs and what was available in those small towns and they just weren't able to kind of get those same, you know, like a job like their father got that was that created a living wage that they could, you know, buy a, a modest house and those kinds of things? Absolutely, Katrina. So basically it was the jobs where you could get by with just a high school degree, the manufacturing jobs, like the a glove factory. Where there was a local glove factory that gave you know really high paid union jobs. There were other local factories. And then partly with globalization, those jobs, the glove factory actually got sold to an overseas buyer, someone who mm -hmm. took it overseas. And you know the factories shut down. And there was nothing replacing them. And mm -hmm. so what kind of job? I mean, there were pipe laying jobs, but then, you know, they have, you know, if you got, they've got laid off, then you, where else would you go? So exactly. It was partly because it used to be that you could get a really good, well-paying job with a high school degree. And then look, globalization, it's just not reversing. I mean, we're just, it's just going to be the way it is. So you all found some solutions with that project? Okay, so there are a number of things that you can do to address these issues. So people who are, for instance, in the middle of addiction, you need to really address that. And there are programs, really smart, well thought out, well tried and true programs that have, you know, with all the trial and error, they now have gotten to a place where they actually can use peer counselors to help people bring themselves out of addiction. It's not surefire. Addiction is a really difficult thing to mm -hmm. solve. Uh, homelessness as well. There are programs now that actually can you know, reduce homelessness. Look, it's a tough problem. There are cities that have tried and failed and there are cities who have tried and succeeded. So there is obviously a way, a method to do it right. And here in Oregon, we should be using the methods that were used that were successful. Mm -hmm. So for instance, in Texas, Houston and Dallas, very interesting. They all, they both had homelessness problems and they wanted to improve it. Several years later, Dallas's homelessness rate went up, Houston's went down. So what did Houston do that was different? Well, you can study it. And one of the reasons that they did was that they use a case method where they basically make sure that you understand all the 360 degree of this one person. You really have to keep a file on and in each individual homeless person because there are many different ways that you can actually try and help them. Sometimes they may have family members that you really want to get them reunited with their family member, or there might be someone else who has, you know, a, a friend, a close friend who has a, a house that has an extra room, but they can't, you know, move themselves. They need help. And then also they need maybe mental health uh, treatment. A lot of it is that as well. And there has to be some local uh, mental health facilities, which, you know, Oregon is suffering from because it doesn't have enough of those. You know what we love so much, Cheryl, about what you're sharing is, by the way, the uh, empathy quotient. Oh, I think you have yeah. passed 200 percent. Here's why Absolutely. I say that. Not only do you feel it, but you tell us in a way that we feel it, too. Mm -hmm. And so I just think both Katrina and I talked about this. How cool is it? You've always been in the area, but you're really involved in the farm. Now, can we talk about the farm, by the way? Oh, of course, of course. There was a fun little thing that Katrina and I saw where you and your daughter and Nick were talking about the farm and the interview asked, do you remember this? And he's in the shed. And he says, oh, I remember the shed. I drove a tractor right through the wall here. So in other words, there's history. I mean, he grew up yes. there and the story of his, we, when we talked to him before, we talked about his father buying it. So, okay. It's a family owned farm over generations. You, I, I have a bone to pick with you though. You, you switched from cherries. Now, Katrina and I both love cherry pie. I don't know what you're talking about, that there was a yeah, drop in demand. You could have just called us and we would have been. <laughs> we could send you all the thousands of pounds of cherries, right? <laughs> so we know that you guys for a second thought about uh, hazelnuts, which are, I got filberts. Is that what they're called right, in order? Right, right, right. But you, my dear, are allergic 
to filberts or hazelnuts, right, right? right? So tell us about some of the crops that you're growing. And because we're here, we're talking about adapting, right? As far as like meeting the challenges of the 21st century. Well, that's what you did because it's not just you. There's employees and so forth. So tell us about that. What how, you know? What's going on at the farm? Well, yes. Yeah, so as you say, we had to switch from cherries because, you know, the cherries, of, unfortunately, Oregon, which had been uh, known for cherries, its share in the cherry market is shrinking. Michigan does very well with cherries. So they have kind of cornered the market. Mm. So if you're not in Michigan, you have, you're stuck with your cherries. No one's going to actually, you know, harvest wow. them. So we actually really had to get out of, of the cherry business. And also it was, it just wasn't, there wasn't much of a future because it is true that people are eating fewer cherry pies, although, you know, they're still eating them, but just eating fewer. And hazelnuts really is a huge growing field. For some reason, we eat a lot of chocolates with hazelnuts in them. Interesting. <laughs> that makes and perfect China. sense to me. <laughs> and, and China also is a huge eater of these filberts in in the chocolates as well. So we did look into that, but obviously it didn't make sense for me. I would not be able to walk outside. And so we decided that wasn't going to work for us. So we ended up partly because our soil is really good for wine. And then we thought, well, let's try cider as well. We just have really good soil and it lended itself to that. And also both wine and cherries, partly because well, I'm sorry, with cherries, you pick by machine. There's a machine that picks cherries, oh, whereas yeah. with apples and with grapes, it really is hand done for the most part. So we thought, well, at least we can also, you know, have jobs available for people. So that was another, you know, reason for going into that. And so we are now in the, uh, you know, cider business. We launched our first cider in the fall. It got great reviews. We were really pleasantly surprised. We couldn't believe it, but people liked it. And our daughter came up with this wonderful label that she, you know, got an artist to draw and really, you know, she did the whole, you know, nine yards with working with a distributor and marketing it. And we'll have another a crop of apples for apple cider in the spring. And uh, so we'll, this one will be a really big one. The first one sold out so quickly that we had to limit like one bottle per person. <laughs> wow. Is it called Christoph Farms? Christoph What's... Farms. It's called Christoph Farms Cider. We'll hopefully be able to pick our first crop of grapes. Although, you know, it's probably not going to be a great, you know, it, it's, it's still really young. We've just recently planted, but we're hoping maybe there'll be some in the fall but we're not sure. Very exciting. What's so amazing about this conversation, uh, and we're just so happy to be having this, you know, this hour with you, is that there just is always a through line in everything that you do, that Nick, that the two of you do, that, you know, is you care about people. You highlight people who are on the margins. You cared about when you created this farm that you would be able to employ people locally. Is there anything that, I'm sure there's a billion, but is there anything that we may not have touched on that you'd really like to share right now that uh, our, our community should know about? It's like things that you've learned recently or what's on your mind? For us, we really care about education because early childhood education, because we really think that where kids are in about the third and fourth grade will kind of give you a signal for where a society or community will be in 25 years, right? And it's oh. 20, 25 years. So you really want to make sure that that level, the kids are doing the best that they can be doing. Wow. Um, and so we think that starting small at the early ages when, first of all, it's less expensive when you're actually trying to educate, you know, little ones versus when they get to be adults and there's issues, you just, that just becomes much more costly. So we just want to emphasize again, early childhood programs and, and education and trying to give the little kids opportunity. Wow. That makes a lot of sense. So we wanted to kind of wrap this up by asking you to say a poem that you quoted during that Rice University commencement speech. It was, it's by Rudyard Kipling and it's called If... It was one of my dad's favorite poems and it's just got such a beautiful message. So we thought maybe you want to quote it again for us. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools or watch the things you gave your life to broken, and stoop and build them up 
with worn out tools. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. You'll be a woman, my girl. You'll be a man, my son. I love that. I think that's Whoa, just beautiful. Man, that's... Thank you so much, Cheryl. Thank, Thank you. you so much for being with us. You are indeed crazy amazing. I want you to feel, I want you to feel something crazy, crazy so that's our show, everyone. We are so grateful to Cheryl Wudon for being with us today. Thank you, Cheryl, for you, making Cheryl. sure. Yes, thank you for making sure to remind us that we are all under the same sky and we can always find ways to help each other in big and small ways. Mm. And if it makes you feel good, if you've enjoyed today's episode and you think it would be meaningful and helpful for someone you know, be a crazy, amazing human and let them know about us. Being here always makes me feel good, I gotta say. <laughs> so a couple of quick reminders, make sure to subscribe to the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, we've also filmed the podcasts, so you can check us out on the Crazy Amazing Humans YouTube channel. Make sure and leave comments, by the way. We love to hear what you're thinking. Yes, and most of all, we want to make sure to thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Remember that every little kindness has the potential to create crazy, amazing human experiences one person at a time. Right, and as always, this week, we want to encourage you to find one thing that you can do to extend kindness and love in the world. I'm Jefferson Denham. And I'm Katrina Carlson. Stay healthy, stay connected, and we will see you right here next time on the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast. I want you to feel, I want you to feel something crazy, crazy amazing. If you have any questions or comments about today's episode, please make sure to write us at crazyamazinghumans at gmail.com.